Добрый день. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the interest that you display to the session. We are glad to see you. Please allow me to open our uh, today's session. I see some people are still coming, but I suggest that we don't uh, deviate too much from our agenda. And in the first place, I'd like to pass it over to the rector of uh, Ranepo, of Vladimir Mao. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, happy to welcome you here. We have here our honorable guests and friends, Mr. Kaganov, Deputy Education and Science Minister of Russia, and Larry Bristow, Ambassador of the United Kingdom to the Russian Federation. Let's welcome them. Of course, one of the most honorable guests here the individual who played key role in the formation of Amber, uh, Sir Paul Judge. For me and my colleagues, it's great honor uh, to be uh, accommodating the 50th anniversary of Amber here at Chanepa. I'm grateful to Sir uh, Paul uh, for having promoted this cooperation between Amber and our academy and the Russian business community in general in the past years, and I wish you all the success in your work. We are uh, not done uh, with uh, our forum yet. Uh, thank you very much, Vladimir. And now I'd like to pass it over to uh, Larry Bristow, uh, plenipotentiary ambassador of the United Kingdom to the Russian Federation. Alexander Vich, uh, ladies and um, uh, gentlemen, good afternoon, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation um, to speak today. Um, the AMBA is in 2017 celebrating its 50th year of activity. The discussion today launches a year of events to mark that anniversary. AMBA is based in the United Kingdom and is the global standard for accrediting MBA, DBA, and master's programs in management education. For example, AMBA accredits MBA programs for the top 2% of business schools worldwide. AMBA has operated in the Russian market for 15 years. Part of that collaboration can be seen through the wonderful Kingston University Vranepa, Vranhig's ex executive MBA program. And I'm delighted that the graduation uh, ceremony for that, uh, that collaboration is held every year at my residence opposite the Kremlin or in the embassy, uh, the British embassy here in Moscow. So I have a particular personal uh, pleasure and interest in celebrating the work of AMBA and also of RANEPA and of Kingston University's collaboration here in Russia. I'd like also to mention um, the United Kingdom's Open University, uh, which is um, very active in executive education here in Russia. I'll say a few more words about that in a minute. The Kingston University and RANEPA collaboration forms part of a much wider engagement in Russia by UK academic institutions and their partner universities in Russia. As far as we know, 3,600 Russian students study every year at UK universities. In addition to RANEPA, a number of other Russian universities offer joint courses. For example, Bauman University and Glindir, Glindir University in Wales. UK institutions are also active in other types of professional training. For example, the Chartered Institute of Securities and Investments, which works with the Russian Central Bank. Also the Chartered Institute of Accountants for England and Wales. More generally, um, the, the Russian government's program to get five of its universities into the global top 100 is a, a, an area of policy where we see the scope for very, very close collaboration between the UK and Russia to the benefit of both countries. It's enormously important when we think about how we, the United Kingdom, um, will relate to Russia 
um, over the next 20, 30, 50 years that we think now about how to create and sustain um, those collaborations, those networks. Very pleased to, uh, to uh, uh, note that Sir Paul Judge, the president of AMBA, is here today as our keynote speaker. He is best placed to tell, tell us about how business education can help to equip professional managers to tackle the challenges of the information age and the industrial and post-industrial economy, and how business education should adapt to those changes. But before I hand over to Sir Paul Judge, um, I said I would return um, to the question of the Open University. Um, I am a graduate of the Open University Business uh, Education Program. I did the Open University MBA about 15 years ago um, as a young diplomat. Um, I was not quite the first diplomat in the British Foreign Ministry to do an MBA, but one of the first four or five. And a lot of people have asked me, why would a diplomat do an MBA? A lot of people 15 years ago asked, why is a diplomat doing an MBA? And when I asked my organization if they would pay for it, that boy, that was the question they asked me. Why, why should we pay for this? Well, some answers to think about. First of all, career options. Um, in today's world, um, you know, we all have to think um, about how we equip ourselves for a working lifetime that may last 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and as with anybody else, um, you, know, you need options. Um, you may not wish to work, I may not wish to work for the foreign ministry for my entire working life. Um, and of course, this, this links with the question of what we call lifelong learning, building skills, updating skills, um, uh, making yourself fit for employment in the modern world, in a world that is changing very fast. Second, I work for a government department. Governments are very, very complex things, um, but they face many of the problems, many of the questions that you deal with also in the private sector. What is knowledge? How do you create it? How do you use it? Um, especially in a world where um, knowledge is highly digitized, it's very contested. You know, is it true, essentially? Um, it may be that you have technical means for um, mining data to produce information knowledge. Um, all decisions that governments make need to be based in an understanding of what they're trying to change, what they're trying to achieve. Leads me on to the second point, change, creativity. The world moves very, very fast indeed these days. Government departments need both to lead and to follow that change. The Foreign Office I joined 25 years ago is very, very different from the Foreign Office today. In 10 years' time, it will be even more different. Um, that's uh, uh, the only certainty I know about in this. Bureaucracies work in, well, bureaucratic ways. One of the biggest tasks, I think, for leaders in any bureaucracy um, is to try to open up the space for creativity, um, to produce new innovative ways of achieving public policy goals. There are, of course, uh, the questions around the core of any MBA course, um, strategy, financial strategy, just being literate, essentially, uh, financially literate, strategically literate. But I think the biggest thing of all is people. Um, if you wish to lead to manage a big organization, if you wish to influence people inside that organization or out it, outside it, if you want to make things happen, you need to think and understand about what motivates people, uh, how you lead, how you manage. That, I think, is for me the core, the center part of any MBA program. One final point to think about, um, it's the relationship between government and business. Um, government and business in my country work very, very closely together. A big part of my job is to support business creating wealth in the UK, um, in Russia. If I don't understand how they operate, I'm not really much used to them. So that's a, a pretty basic reason for, for um, doing an MBA. I use what I learned on the MBA every single day. Um, usually without thinking about it. I hope that's the sign um, uh, that um, it worked because it was internalized. Uh, but I can't think of a single thing that I do during my working day uh, that does not benefit from the fact of having done that MBA 15 years ago. Thank you.
Ambassador, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, it's wonderful and quite rare to find an ambassador from any country with an MBA, and we greatly appreciate your thoughts and your recommendations. Um, I'd now like to welcome as our next speaker, uh, Veniamin Kaganov, the Deputy Minister of Education for Russia. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Mr. Rector, uh, well, of course, you are free to go, but thank you for organizing the forum. Mr. Ambassador, dear colleagues, I'm really impressed by the number of uh, people, enthusiastic people, who are present in this representative audience to discuss the questions related to further uh, development of education, science, business, all those being the areas which have been developing uh, in the uh, framework of interaction between different people, different countries, regardless of uh, the political uh, winds that may be blowing, we're always glad to maintain our contacts as far as our relations with the United Kingdom are concerned. I'd like to note uh, the year of literature and uh, languages has just finished. And uh, the results, outcomes of that year is events exceed our most daring expectations. Events such as space in Russia, this event here in the center of London, uh, was named the most important uh, event organized on an international scale uh, by the Russian and British party. And currently we are discussing further uh, Russian-British years, which will be devoted to areas such as healthcare and so forth, education, and we're preparing ourselves for uh, preliminary events. I think that uh, all forms of activities uh, working within various associations, uh, all those things are extremely important. And in this sense, professional associations that generate opportunities for experience exchange are also key. Speaking about uh, the uh, uh, policies of the Ministry of Education in general, we are like any other uh, ministry, any other government, are always striving to improve the quality and availability of education at all levels. If members of your associations work mostly with uh, adults grown up, uh, business people who nevertheless require to continuously improve their training level, uh, we all work with all ages starting from preschools, kindergartens, those who then uh, opt for uh, working in the area of administration or uh, business administration. In the past years, we have been reinforcing contacts between those who work in the area of education and business persons. Uh, we have been encouraging business people to pay more attention to uh, education through setting standards uh, for education. Uh, business people calls to improve the standards of education are uh, part of our day-to-day -day work. We are engaged in developing and uh, improving education standards. We work at different uh, chairs in departments of universities and training centers, which helps us to uh, get closer uh, to uh, the existing international uh, standards for uh, business administration training 
In this sense, everything that will be discussed here uh, that has been discussed at the forum so far is very helpful and instrumental and we are uh, really grateful to you for uh, your feedback. Everything will be taken into account in our policy uh, development and making. I wish all the participants successful uh, work at this event, share ideas. Uh, we are uh, finishing to celebrate the new year. Uh, we are in the first day of our uh, old style new year is good time for me to wish all the success to all of you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to pass it over to the executive director of AMB, uh, Andrew Wolf. Uh, Ashot, thank you very much indeed. I'm just going to spend literally a couple of minutes um, just telling you a little bit of an overview of AMBER because I'm aware that many of you are MBAs and some of you aren't and perhaps don't know much about AMBER. Um, we're the market leader for accrediting business schools in Russia with 11 schools accredited, uh, eight in Moscow, two in St. Petersburg and one in Kazan. And we accredited our first school here 25 years ago. So this is our 50th anniversary. But actually, it's a great credit to our Russian schools that they started to want to become inter of international standard and internationally accredited um, a long time ago. Uh, we accredit 246 business schools around the world. And if you look at how the market is moving, uh, it's very much the emerging nations where the growth is. So a few years ago, we had five accredited schools in China and one in India. We now have 30 in China and 10 in India. So the world is actually, the world of business school growth is very much mirroring the world of economic growth. And that's exactly the way uh, it should be. Uh, we promote accreditation, our standards, very strongly all over the world. Our advertising, uh, including in Russian, is in seven different countries. Um, and if you can see this, although I'm not going to leave it there for long, this explains the five key criteria uh, that a Russian school, or indeed any of the 246 schools, has to be able to achieve in order to become one of, uh, as the ambassador said, just 2% of the world's schools to be accredited by AMBA. So it's an enormous credit to your school and you should feel very confident um, from your own school that you are getting a world-class education. Uh, the other good news is that um, we're not just an accreditation organization. We are a global membership organization for students and alumni who have an MBA from an AMBER accredited school. Uh, and the even better news is that membership is absolutely free. So if you are a current MBA student at any one of the 11 schools, um, or you are an alumnus of any one of those schools with an MBA, you can join AMBER completely free of charge and you become a member of a global network of what is, as at this morning, 23,000 members. Uh, that membership has quadrupled in size in the last two years alone, and members from the 246 schools are currently joining us at the rate of 1,000 a month. Um, I've just come back uh, with Leah, my head of events before Christmas from India, um, and over 1,000 Indian members joined us in just four evenings. So uh, the ambassador talked earlier, and Paul will talk a bit later about the real value of, how, of being understanding of global culture and global business best practice. Uh, and I look forward very much to welcoming you to your AMBA membership. So you're part of a network that's only of other AMBA school MBAs. It's not like a LinkedIn where people are trying to sell things to you the whole time. It is smart global people like yourself. Um, there are lots of free benefits, there's careers advice, there's jobs availability um, with major multinationals that are posted looking for high flyers around the world. Um, there are a lot of events, both virtual events and physical events like this event today around the world and also a series of prestigious benefits. So you become a member of the Amber Global community. Uh, the sign up is very simple. Uh, if you complete the form outside, which many of you did, um, we will then email you back an invitation. It takes less than two minutes to join and then you're in the Amber network. Uh, we already have about 500 uh, Russian members and look forward to welcoming 
happening many more. You can network, um, look for jobs, seek career advice, or find MBA friends around the world. Uh, these are some of the major multinationals who've worked closely with us over the last two years, providing career advice as to how to join their companies, in some cases actual jobs, but also giving you advice about how to further your career, both when you are a student, but also in mid-career, when you're in your 30s, 40s and 50s, how do you keep improving and what are those very sharp multinationals looking for in current skills. Um, and, and finally, one of your free benefits from day one, um, you're all entitled, if you're an AMBA member, to a year's free subscription to the Wall Street Journal online. Um, that is normally $275, but your AMBA membership is free and that subscription to the Wall Street Journal is free. There are many smart companies who want to network with yourselves and our dream and our vision is to create um, a, a group of between 50 and 100,000 of the world's best EMBAs as a force for good in society. I believe, and my final comment would be, if you look at some of the problems around the world, we shouldn't and couldn't just expect governments and military forces to solve them. Wherever I see success in troubled times, it's often through a vibrant, fair distribution of wealth and a vibrant business community of entrepreneurs and large company leaders who are providing wealth in a country. And where there is a reasonable distribution of wealth, there is normally much more likelihood of peace and harmony. So we, we believe we'll create the world's most powerful group of current and future world leaders. And I look forward to welcoming you, many of you, all of those of you eligible to join. Thank you very much. I'm now going to welcome our next speaker, who I've known and loved for many years, but you will be testing some of my Russian pronunciation here. Um, Sergei, uh, a great friend of Amber, um, Mia Soyedov. How's that, Sergei? Not too bad? Thank you very much. Esteemed ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to speak here it's just by chance, not all of you know me, because here I can see the representatives of a number of best business schools of Russia. So I just want to mention that it so happened that I have three hats today. Hope that not for a long time. I am dean of one of the leading business schools of Russia that belongs to this academy, IBS Moscow. I'm vice rector of this academy, and I'm president of RABE, Russian Association of Business Education, where all the leading Russian business schools work together. So, so very quickly, with all those three hats, I want to express some of my feelings. As a dean of IBS Renepa, I met the people from AMBA about a decade ago, and when I asked them about the opportunity to get this world-recognized accreditation, I didn't just got the answer, yes, no, something. I got a very human, friendly and cooperative approach. A representative of AMBA physically stayed with me 17 astronomic hours, astronomic hours, through two days from morning till night with coffee and lunch break. It was at one of the conferences. Uh, it was a huge friendly tutorial when all the rules of AMBA accreditation were explained to me. Lots of questions were asked. After that, we were working hard for about a year to catch up with the requirements. And now when I'm looking back, it happened about a decade. That helped to the programs of MBA and executive MBA level of my business school to improve the quality dramatically, to bring extra value to our executive students. And I am, as a dean, I am very thankful to AMBA and I am honored that we are cooperating and I am honored that my business school belongs to AMBA accredited school families. Second hand, 
as a vice rector of this academy, where we have several business schools, several departments which are running MBA program, I am pleased to say that over the last decade, four structures of RENEPA passed this very rigid accreditation and got the seal of quality for their programs. I do hope that this list is not final. As a vice rector responsible for business education, I am dreaming about the day when all the MBA programs of RENEPA would manage to get recognition and high quality standard of AMBA. And as a president of RABE, where about 150 business schools of Russia are present, I want to say that out of this list of 150 schools, only 11 for today managed to bypass the accreditation barrier of quality. I want to stress it once again. 11 business schools out of 150. Again, I do hope and I dream that this family would be increased twice, thrice, etc. But it's a very rigid, very useful accreditation, and I hope that all of all the business schools of the country would be working hard to join step by step to the great AMBA family. Using this opportunity, I want to wish AMBA on this celebration of its 50th anniversary the further progress the further success in promotion of quality in business and management education. I'm so happy to welcome AMBA in Russia. Thank you very much for the support of Russian business education. God bless you. Thank you very much, Sergei. Um, after the Gaidar Forum last year, uh, I went up on the following day and spent uh, a very insightful day with our two schools in St. Petersburg. So I'm therefore delighted to welcome uh, our next speaker, Konstantin Krotov, the first Deputy Director of the Higher School of Management at St. Petersburg State University. Thank you very much. Uh, you told me I will be the seventh, but really, time got passed so fast, so... Um, you are the seventh. Yes, <laughs> yes. I will continue in Russian. Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. I am happy to uh, be present at the last session of Gaida Forum in a warm environment with so many uh, people in the audience and congratulate MB on the 15th anniversary. It's fantastic figure. I would like uh, to start uh, from the questions that have been uh, enumerated within the uh, subject of this panel uh, concerning adaptation and transformation, uh, change, uh, and uh, of course uh, the modern world, we have heard about this at uh, this forum and we see it with our own eyes, uh, is uh, changing quite c rapidly and we often do not understand what's going on because we have no time to make models, to study them, to analyze them and to speak about them, to test them, to check them. So the world is moving faster than anything that we can do, and this uh, produces demand for new education, new models, new formats. Uh, and uh, there is another sec a second aspect of which I would like to speak uh, in this context, uh, that is uh, the great number of uh, uh, successful uh, business models and niche solutions, uh, and so uh, students who come to uh, classrooms now and who create the demand, they no longer want uh, universal concepts which would explain everything to them and for any case that might happen, anything that might happen in life, they want to uh, exact uh, specific uh, examples, specific practice, specific tools which, we, which they can use uh, tomorrow or today when they come to uh, their company. Uh, we see it now uh, when we talk to our own students or our own uh, uh, 
alumni and uh, are we often um, hear that there is a huge demand for practitioners uh, for, for quick results uh, and uh, this makes teaching difficult uh, and uh, at this forum and at other platforms we hear that many universities many business uh, schools uh, teach uh, in their own way and their own things uh, and uh, we can honestly say that often uh, we uh, uh, try uh, to teach uh, uh, methods that became obsolete. Uh, we tried to solve uh, uh, yesterday's uh, problems and we say that we are doing this for few le leaders of the future. But this works, uh, the world uh, is going on, the students come to classrooms uh, uh, and buy um, expensive AMBA programs. Uh, strange that may seem but uh, coming back to demand uh, demands made by students uh, by the audiences uh, uh, the approach is changing toward who is the teacher who actually teaches uh, we often bring practitioners to our classrooms uh, to satisfy our students demand but uh, it is very difficult to find such practitioners who can describe their experience in a way that could be easily understood. So we have to work with them, to train them, uh, to teach them to them. And then we have also another solution is uh, to find teachers who have uh, a huge uh, practical experience, but it's either too expensive or impossible. So we usually use one of these two solutions, or sometimes we make a mix of them, and there are two people in uh, the classroom. One knows the practice, and this uh, second one uh, tra uh, transmits it, uh, generalizes it, it, analyzes it, and all uh, is done in real time. And uh, in, uh, as a result, as, uh, the same lecture cannot be given uh, for a second time, because the world is changing. Uh, and the question who is going to teach and how is uh, really difficult. We don't know what happens uh, five or ten years uh, uh, in five or ten years, or even tomorrow, perhaps uh, teachers will turn into facilitators, perhaps uh, uh, we will have a different uh, approach to scientific research, uh, and there is also uh, the online education is encroaching, and so lots of basic things can be learned from it, and so we often hear that uh, a manager or leader is bad if uh, he doesn't ed constantly educate himself. So there is no sense uh, in uh, teaching certain things which we used to, t uh, to think. And if, and if we talk not uh, about open uh, progr teaching programs uh, to which people uh, come with different demands, uh, but of corporate programs, it's much uh, simpler. It's uh, easier to describe, to explain emotional intellect uh, or train various uh, skills uh, it but it doesn't uh, uh, make uh, the object the work of the business school better because uh, demands uh, because uh, such specific demands uh, lead uh, to the necessity of even deeper analysis. I would like to give an example of one of our many corporate uh, programs, a program uh, that was uh, implemented with the VTB Bank, one of our key partners, and the bank said, yes, we have certain specific demands, we need to change our culture, we need uh, to, be, to, get, uh, to adapt to international uh, demands, but, and we want to know inter specific international uh, experience and so we always had two people in our classroom one of them was an international star uh, with a brilliant uh, uh, pr practice and the second was one of our teacher who in fact translated uh, the uh, this experience told by this uh, world guru uh, in marketing or leadership or anything into our russian realities uh, adapting it. Um, so schools now must be adaptable to the changes, to the world that we do not know. And I believe that uh, the AMBA and other accreditation uh, organizations uh, have an e a uh, very great role to play and their mission is very difficult because they 
uh, need not just accredit this qualitative level which the school must uh, demonstrate, but they must be also conduits for new uh, standards, new formats. They must spend uh, best business practices. And uh, to concluding my presentation, I would like to wish uh, prosperity to AMBA in this sphere and uh, great success in your hard work which consists in not just uh, giving us quality, uh, high quality teaching but also to make us conduits of uh, best practices in uh, business education thank you very much and now to the first of our of our business leaders um, many years ago when i was at the harvard business school the two most detailed case studies we did were the success of general electric and jack welsh and the success of Dell and Michael Dell. And in the years since then, I've been very fortunate conduct to conduct two live interview shows with Michael Dell, similar today. And he's one of the smartest business leaders I've ever met. But more importantly for today, the Dell business model is one of the most intelligent business models I've ever seen anywhere in the world. So we're absolutely delighted to welcome Boris Shelbakov, the general manager of Dell Russia, um, with great advice, I am sure. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for such a grandiose representation. Uh, well, in fact, I, I was not supposed to represent. My, I was not supposed to represent Michael Dell here as the icon of American business, who did really a marvelous job, uh, marvelous job in in setting completely new business model uh, that now spans across the world. Uh, we have the business uh, set up in 180 countries in this world, and you, you can imagine that each one of these countries uh, requires some f some sort of uh, uh, talent uh, to run this business. So I'm I'm fortunate enough uh, to know Michael Dell personally, of course, and I'm fortunate to have this uh, challenge of managing uh, Russian business and in uh, CIS business for Michael Dell uh, in this country. But, uh, I, of course, I would like to start with, uh, with congratulations to Amber, which is an important story. Uh, but uh, we, we, we wanted also to discuss the, the, to discuss the reality of the business education in general, not just talking about uh, the success stories uh, around the world. So am I an alien element to the professional community of you guys sitting here in this room? Not at all. I'm not alien. I'm your customer. And I'm the influencing customer. So I'm... I'm sort of a part of the model, part of the game uh, with this business education. I want to get as much of a course fertilization between educational business, which you are in the business also, and my business. Uh, because I'm a consumer. I'm the customer of yours. And therefore, I'm interested in uh, driving the quality of uh, people, of talent uh, that are educated on, on MBA whether it's a certified school or non-certified. To be honest, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not that deep into this subject to know what's the basic difference. Because mostly, I, I believe that mostly we're talking about to, to certified business schools. But in, a, in any case, uh, I wanted to say that uh, what, what we need from the, from the people, from the managers uh, generally, we want them to be able to talk the same language across all these uh, entities and across all the, the countries that they sit in. Uh, not only the same language, but to share the values and to talk about the common values also. We want them across the variety of cultures uh, to, to have more or less common goals because otherwise you won't be successful in big business, especially in a corporate world which spans across the, the globe. Uh, you may definitely fail if you don't get to, to the same level of understanding between amongst people. Uh, we are all the part of a continuous learning process, as uh, His Excellency Ambassador referred to the earlier. We are in a lifelong education. The, Similarly, we are in a, in a lifelong and continuous learning. And let's not overestimate MBA. MBA is just the part of it, of course. We all start from the kindergarten and end up until we can learn anything at all. So MBA is just one of it. And uh, I would uh, very, be, be, be very caution, uh, cautionary about uh, being arrogant. Well, some people after MBA, uh, they will behave like they, they knew the, the truths 
but the, the truth uh, comes uh, with the life lo lifelong learning, really. And sometimes it doesn't come at all. Sometimes you have to live a hundred years to get to the truth point. So MBA is just part of his educational process. And also expanding career opportunities is a definitely important thing for, for anybody who gets, uh, who graduates from MBA thing. But uh, apart from that, what do I like business schools to focus on. Again, I'm repeating myself. I have to, do, to, to say the same story all the time because I feel that there's a lack of focus to this aspect. During this uh, more or less 6,000 years of people documented history, the human being has not changed much. We have all the same sins, we have all the same uh, virtues, not more or less all the same. But uh, we want people not just to learn what to do, to learn the processes and to guide them through the business models of different kinds in different countries. But we want them to understand how to do it. Le leading the society and leading the business that they're responsible for with integrity, with honesty, with moral standards, uh, with the foundational values that can only come uh, with, the, with a specific focus. If you don't do that on every level of this education, uh, you will definitely fail. Therefore, I would uh, recommend highly to focus on emotional intelligence versus IQ, developing IQ in general. Emotional intelligence helps you guys to talk to each other. It's a compassion. It's ability to understand another human being. It's ability to communicate at the end of the day. People make business with people. We, we are all in, in, in the world uh, that is uh, complex enough uh, if, if you forget about this aspect. Therefore, uh, I would say that MBA uh, love days are over, however strange it may sound at this, uh, at this uh, meeting now. I think this love affair of the market with MBA has ended about a few years ago when the crisis struck us, more or less. As classic would put it, uh, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. Hmm? And somewhere, the summer leaves have all too short a date. That's what uh, Shakespeare said. And uh, now we will follow him. We have to find the new ways to survive in this marketplace, which is changing. And our goal now is to, uh, to take the best, first of all, of all the international learnings that we can get through the accreditation process, uh, through the uh, integration of business uh, community with international bodies as well, and to adapt it to local reality, which is, to my mind, more important. We have to find uh, new ways without compromising the integrity that I spoke about earlier. And uh, we have to do without uh, much of a wishful thinking. Sorry to say that again. Uh, and again, uh, we are fantasizing a lot of how the world would look like in 10 years. Nobody knows that, to be honest. If I knew the price of oil, tomorrow probably I'll be a billionaire. But nobody knows that. Uh, live alone 10 years, horizons which we, we normally don't have as human beings. Uh, we may fantasize about it, but it's not practical. Uh, should we follow demand with the business education? No, we should drive it. We should drive change, setting these high standards of knowledge and integrity with completely zero tolerance to wrongdoing. I'll put it in a simple way uh, without expanding too much on the emotional side of it, without any wrongdoing. So that's where the future lies for me. It lies in uh, foundational values, it lies in integrity and honest business. And we have to teach that on every, on every level of education, including MBA as well. And again, thank you very much for inviting me, and I'll pass the regards to Michael Dell, if you wish. Thank you. Boris, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Sergei Kalanjan, the Dean of the Graduate School of Corporate Management at RANEPA. Uh, good afternoon, friends. I am uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, I am a bit awed by uh, the presence of Her Majesty's uh, ambassador. Uh, uh, dear friends, I have been told that I could sp uh, that I can speak without uh, slides and in Russian. Yesterday, and the platform of the Gaida uh, Forum uh, had a great discussion on the fact uh, uh, that Europe stretches from Lisbon to Vladivostok and uh, that 
and we spoke about uh, reality and dreams. And now, when I see, so see our uh, beloved uh, classroom 237, I can rephrase it, uh, Europe from uh, uh, London to Moscow and Vladivostok is a single education uh, space, thanks to the AMBA and its uh, hard work, uh, uh, which has been going on for 15 years in Russia. And this is my key point. And here at the platform of this forum, uh, events uh, take place uh, sometimes, which allow to put into uh, practice uh, things you are dreaming about. Uh, 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 th thanks to Sergei Pavlovich, I met uh, uh, a Sir Paul Church, uh, and we discussed the possibility of accreditation of, uh, of the programs of the higher uh, school, and Sir Paul Church is very friendly, is a very kind person. He said, well, Sergei, if you really have such a dream, just make an application, and the commission will take, uh, will consider it, uh, and so on. But uh, I had one uh, serious problem. In May, the school celebrated its 20th anniversary, and they also had an anniversary. It was a coincidence. And everybody told me that it, is, that it was impossible for experts of the AMBM came, came here, and we had to translate 300 pages into English, but I will be brief. It was a success, and we managed before our jubilee anniversary, we could get a certification by the MBA of all of the three hour uh, programs, uh, MBA, executive MBA, and uh, business administration doctor. But we did not arrange uh, that uh, the fall of the ruble right after that, uh, the economic crisis, uh, we reckoned without the sanctions and many other events, and that uh, this would result in a certain uh, economic uh, slow down and uh, many things and now uh, and we have found out that these four letters a and b a uh, had a magic power they suggested uh, uh, we are talking about the emotional intelligence emotional emotional intelligence i have been reading about it i read so i read it uh, the whole for the whole night and i found out that first of all it is love love for those who are for your students your teachers your colleagues your partners so love must reign around the business school <laughs> And, of, and there should be also openness you should share with everyone. When there is a crisis, you should share with everybody. And you shouldn't drink alone. You know, in Russia, it is considered bad taste to drink alone. But in any case, we uh, very seriously, we have totally changed the marketing straight strategy. We believed that... Uh, marketing in a crisis uh, is a waste of money we should direct sales uh, have direct sales but we can have may, the sale sell directly when you have good emotional intelligence and when uh, your alumni like you and as a result we did not spend any money on uh, the media of course uh, i do not want them to be offended they need to find sources of funding but we used all the money on making our website better and on uh, uh, travel through Great Russia and Kazakhstan. And as a result, we uh, got 70% of new uh, students upon uh, recommendations of our former students. And uh, for 80% of those 70%, uh, the uh, AMBA accreditation mattered a lot. Uh, friends, I would like to say that uh, we also strengthened our networking. Uh, we began to uh, hold the business breakfasts for alumni, and when old friends uh, meet each other, get together, they uh, have new, they get, get new ideas. It also 
And we also facilitated marriages of our alumni. It is very important because we talk about the business all the time, but uh, families and children are also extremely important. Um, and let us take the doctor of uh, business administration. Uh, we increased uh, the number of students uh, twofold. Now we have over 40 people, and we follow the recommendations made by the commission. Uh, we should uh, teach instead of three years, four years. Everybody uh, told me, Sir, uh, Sergei, you are demented. People uh, find three years with difficulty, and you now increase this uh, time. But uh, uh, after this increase, uh, we, uh, the number of students has also increased. And I would like to end on this uh, upbeat note, but there's another important thing. Well. Uh, we began uh, celebrating the 50th, 50th anniversary of the AMBA, but I have already a ticket uh, for London, uh, for London, and uh, I have uh, booked my hotel. I have a suit and a, and a black tie, but I still haven't got a visa. I, you see. I did not. Uh, I did not address uh, 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 the ambassador. I still told this to the audience. Uh, so thank you very much. Dreams come true with the MBA. Thank you very much. Uh, Your ambassador's uh, visa in the next five minutes. <laughs> Uh, I'd now like to welcome our, our second business leader speaker and, and from the world of fast moving consumer goods or fast mover consumer, consumer durables, uh, however you'd like to categorize it. The Vice President of Philips Consumer Lifestyle for Russia and the CIS. Please welcome Maxim Kuznetsov. Maxim. I'll also speak without the slides and in Russian as I have been uh, required. I, uh, in fact, I studied uh, this program for a bit less than two years uh, since I have. Uh, so it is for two years. That it is two years since I uh, finished it, and it's a pleasure for me to be here at such an important point in time when there are such important guests. Uh, when you all are here, I'm glad to share my memories and my perception of that program because uh, having come back. Uh, coming back to uh, for you. Uh, for years, I was choosing at the time. I was choosing a program for myself. I had been in business for 14 or 15 years. I had exper experience of working large scale, uh, large international companies, and uh, for me, it is a uh, discovery that there are 150 business schools at that time. I knew of about perhaps 50, but nonetheless, it was an embargo uh, and uh, at that time, the certification of the AMBA and uh, an international certificate was a critically important criterion. Perhaps uh, because of my career experience, I have worked uh, for such companies as Electrolux, uh, and for 11 years I have uh, worked uh, for Philips. Uh, I was very practical. I work. I have worked for a for 11 years for a Dutch company, perhaps in one year after, or two years after, we'll work in Brazil or the UK or some other country. So if I receive additional uh, education in a non-certified uh, business school, well, I will have uh, an education which will be not very liquid. And so I decided to join this particular program. That's uh, uh, what uh, what concerns my experience and my experience of cooperation with the AMBA? Yes, it would be uh, it would be a right to say a few words about the program. Looking back and within the framework of the forum, I uh, I managed to exchange opinions uh, with uh, some of my former co-students. <coughs> Those years were very important for us because we left the comfort zone. <laughs> and the education pro 
And the business education program is very good for leaders as it, it is allows you to leave the uh, comfort zone because when uh, people are within uh, a certain uh, ecosystem, they develop successfully uh, uh, career-wise, but such programs allow them uh, to act uh, not as a leader but as someone led and to listen and watch your teacher. Another important thing is the selection of the group. At least five or six persons uh, from people in whom, with whom I studied or asked uh, are, are among my friends. I have close contacts with them. It is uh, rather difficult uh, to find new friends when you are not so young. And this program, when you spend two years within uh, the same team, allows you to find something in common and we had a very fine selection. We had uh, a 50-50 uh, share of uh, owners, business owners, and uh, hired managers. And it allowed me, who has worked uh, uh, as a hired, uh, had worked as a hired uh, manager, uh, do you have an experience of um, business owners who during these five years managed to build a company? And so they managed uh, to go the same way, but in a different quality. And for me, it was a very important takeaway uh, from this program. Today, we have spoken about emotional intelligence. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm, or I have also been curious about this uh, wording. I understand it as uh, uh, something like soft skills, uh, because emotional intelligence, just like soft skills, is something which is difficult to, to measure. And uh, this is something which makes uh, a director different uh, between a leader. A director is someone who is an executive, and a person who has emotional intelligence can lead the process, can spread his ideas to other people and move the organization to a new stages of its development. That's all that I wanted to say. I am grateful to the program. I am grateful for uh, this invitation to speak here today. And uh, during these years, uh, I uh, learned a lot, and uh, they have been very useful to me. I'm really pleased to welcome our, our next speaker, because in all the countries where we accredit around the world, provided we can find schools of the right quality, we do like to spread beyond the capital city or the second city. Um, and so we wanted, provided there was the quality there, to accredit in at least a third city outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg. And that we duly did uh, just a couple of years ago, and, and perhaps highly appropriately, it was in the, the rapidly growing city of Kazan. So please welcome Alsu Ahmed Shinar, the director of the Higher Business School at Kazan Federal University. Меня, видимо, по гендерному признаку поставили чуть в лучшие условия, сказали на русском, но с презентацией. Kazan School of Business to take part uh, in this important event. I'd also like to congratulate AMBA on its 50th anniversary. I wish you all the success uh, in doing business here in Russia. We're the first Russia's regional business school. In March 2015, we were uh, accredited by MBA. The international acknowledgement, it is acknowledged internationally. Uh, that AMBA uh, sets the best standards in business uh, administration education. Uh, well, uh, in the past years, MBA uh, programs offered uh, by our business school are not only in demand by our uh, region's business, but also by other regions, such as Volga region, uh, some CIS states, uh, the uh, improvement of our uh, competitiveness along with the growing competitiveness 
uh, of Kazan State University is yet another achievement. We offer a broad range of MBA programs today. Not all of them are in line uh, with the highest quality standards. It is only possible if uh, the accreditation principles are observed and our business school is fully in line with those principles uh, which makes it uh, competitive and reputable. Uh, well, uh, AMB accreditation allowed us in 2016 to take part in bidding arrangements and uh, win standards to provide education uh, services. We have also improved our faculty through inviting both Russian and international uh, professors and uh, practical experts with significant business experience. We continuously um, increase our uh, skill sets, grow our skill sets, uh, maintain contacts with international business community, uh, maintain contacts with the leading uh, businesses. It helps us to grow uh, the role of our business school as to, uh, to uh, promote and um, improve human capital and achieve synergy of education and business. The uh, strategy of our business school, which is about interacting with real sector uh, enterprises, help us to rely upon the strategy of social and economic development of the Republic of Tatarstan, Tatarstan uh, 2030, which sets priorities for uh, the development of our region. Today, Tatarstan is one of the uh, best developed constituencies of the Russian Federation. In terms of our uh, region's uh, GDP, we are number six among the constituencies of the Russian Federation. In terms of uh, investments, we are number four. In terms of uh, manufacturing and construction, we are number five. If you look at national um, a rating of the Russian Federation, Tatarstan is a leader, uh, providing the uh, best uh, conditions for uh, doing business. What are uh, the key areas for our interaction with the real economy? Our business school offers MBA uh, programs for uh, specific verticals based on their priorities and the priorities of our republic's uh, development goals. We take into account uh, future changes, uh, the needs of uh, high-tech industries and demand for uh, new competencies. Uh, looking at the improvement of effectiveness and efficiency of uh, doing business. Uh, well, our top priorities are information technology, uh, which is one of the highest priorities of our republic. We are implementing Open Tatarstan program. Uh, the purpose of this program is introduction and broad usage of information and communication technologies in all uh, areas of business, uh, putting uh, uh, in place a common uh, ICT environment. Uh, we uh, are also implementing uh, our IT uh, city uh, program, uh, given the importance uh, of our IT uh, projects, uh, we uh, have included IT management in our curriculum. And 22 companies of the Republic take part in this exercise. Uh, agriculture uh, is also very important for us. In the past three years, Tatarstan's agricultural sector has been growing dynamically. We managed to maintain our positions among the uh, regions of Russia. Our uh, MB program for uh, agriculture is aimed to uh, offer uh, products uh, based on uh, state-of-the-art uh, ICT technologies. We also have competitive healthcare uh, cluster. Uh, there is Republican uh, healthcare development uh, program and strategy for the period up to 2030. Uh, we are putting in place an end to end integrated cluster based on uh, three growth points, including uh, Kazankomsk and Almatysk uh, economic zones. 
in the beginning of 2016, we launched an MB program with a healthcare management specialization, which comprises 26 leaders of both uh, public and private organizations leaders. We have uh, launched the vertically integrated oil and gas cluster. Uh, and areas such as uh, smart materials and uh, other initiatives. In the beginning of 2016, we have been implementing an industrial MB program for uh, the money industry. Uh, 20 uh, mid-level and top-level uh, managers in each group. Tatarstan has significant R&D potential and scientific potential, and we are number five in terms of uh, manufacturing output. Our machine building is very efficient, which includes uh, automobile uh, making, aircraft building. One of the growth points is uh, Kamsky uh, Industrial Cluster. One of the uh, enterprises of the cluster provide training to uh, uh, business managers based on our programs. Uh, we also have an efficient energy cluster and related sustainable uh, energy subcluster. Proceeding from the uh, needs of the energy sector, every year we provide training to at least 15 leaders of major uh, companies of uh, this sector, both uh, grid and uh, generation companies. Uh, well, uh, in doing this work, uh, we m enable synergy between business education, government, and real business. Uh, thanks to international accreditation, we can offer high standard programs based on uh, international standards and best practices. We can also invite uh, international experts who help us to uh, improve our human capital. It also uh, helps us to uh, solve uh, the problems of our republic's social and economic development. Thank you very much for your attention. Shalia. In my experience uh, so far in, in the higher education industry, it's very rare to find at the highest level uh, a global leader who is extremely knowledgeable and experienced in the world of education, but who also was and still is uh, a major commercial business leader in their own right. Uh, and Amber has certainly benefited from that for 20 of these last 50 years. So I'd like to welcome, uh, to give his views on where the business world is changing and what you will need to know for the future of your careers. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, our president, Sir Paul Judge. Дамы и господа, уважаемые гости, господа деканы, директора, студенты, выпускники, добро пожаловать. Я уже пятый год подряд выступаю на этом мероприятии, в Гайдаровском форуме, в этом помещении. И я считаю для себя честью находиться здесь. Сегодня мы говорим о бизнес-школах как катализаторах новаторства. И я э, очень рад выступать перед такой представительной аудиторией, аудиторией э, людей, которые понимают, о чем тут идет речь. Я э, занимаю должность президента АМБ уже э, 20 лет. Некоторые вещи из тех, что происходили, я уже даже и вспомнить не могу. Но, тем не менее, э, самое главное, что мы сегодня с уверенностью смотрим в будущее, опираясь на тот опыт, который был на, накоплен за прошедшее время, относительно того, э, как развивались бизнес-школы, бизнес-образование, дает мне представление о том, как они будут развиваться в будущем. Мы оказываем поддержку образованием. В связи с этим хочу сослаться на Нельсон Мандел, который говорил, что образование – это мощное оружие, которое можно использовать для того, чтобы изменить мир. Альберт Эйнштейн, тоже творческая личность, говорил, что обучение – это не продукт, получаемый в школе, это нечто, что приобретается всю жизнь. Он сказал, каждый человек – гений. Но если вы будете э, судить рыбу по ее способности э, лазить по деревьям, э, вы э, э, потратили всю свою жизнь э, зря и будете думать, что э, рыба дура. А ведь это не так. Хочу поздравить вас. 
Вот. Ваш диплом и ваш первый чек на получение пособия, пособия по безработице. Достаточно цинично звучит. Вы знаете, что такое MBA, что означает эта аббревиатура? Некоторые говорят, что MBA – это mediocre but arrogant, посредственность, но амбициозная. Но на самом деле не все считают, что это замечательно. Рынок решает. Количество людей, получивших степень в MBA, растет. Мир образования меняется. Нынешняя система образования была рассчитана на эпоху индустриализации, как минимум в России. Но пришло время проведения комплексных перевен. Мы живем в мире, который взаимосвязан. Сегодня радикальным образом меняется то, что должны делать руководители. Растет население. Мы являемся свидетелями глобализации. Ресурсы, доступные нам, становятся все более и более скудными. Кроме того, информация сегодня нам всем доступна как никогда. Самое главное, учащиеся должны хорошо понимать, в каком мире они живут. Поскольку современные учащиеся не остаются на работе у одного и того же работодателя в течение всей своей жизни, им приходится проходить учебу в самых разных областях. Сергей, например, марксизм-ленинизм несколько десятилетий преподавал, представляете, а после этого ему пришлось радикальным образом сменить направление своей деятельности. Сегодня нам требуются междисциплинарные знания, знания в самых разных областях. Приходится решать самые разные проблемы в самых разных областях. У нас есть статистика занятости выпускников средней школы и высшей школы. И сегодня структура занятости одна, но через 10-20 лет она будет совершенно другой. Это связано с появлением новых технологий. Сегодня в учебе, работе мы используем самые разные высокие технологии. Это позволяет нам быть творческими людьми, учиться быстрее делать это более гибко. Мы приобретаем лидерские навыки, коммуникационные навыки, и все это происходит на глобальной основе. Давайте поговорим теперь о том, как предоставляются образовательные услуги, как люди получают образование. Это вот классическая картина аудитории. Ну, конечно, это не в этой академии фотография была сделана. Здесь он наверняка по-другому, но во многих случаях это именно так. Я изучал химию в Кембридже. И э, вот так вот мы конспектировали наших преподавателей. Нам приходилось все конспектировать, а сегодня информация доступна где угодно. Находясь в Китае, можно погуглить, можно войти в Яху и получить там любую информацию. Э, то же самое сегодня доступно нам в любой другой точке мира. Дистанционное обучение. Сегодня эта тема становится также очень популярной. Нам доступны сотни курсов, которые генерируются десятками ведущих высших учебных заведений мира. Всевозможные онлайновые курсы. На сегодня насчитывается как минимум 5 миллионов подписок на прохождение таких курсов. И сегодня мы больше времени проходим, проводим за компьютерами. Более 90% учащихся сегодня не заканчивают те курсы, которые начинают, и не приступают к другим курсам. Это означает, что количество людей, которые учатся, они просто получают какую-то степень, намного больше. И намного больше, чем это предполагается нашими специалистами по пиар. Какое же будущее образование? В будущем классов не будет. Весь мир ваш класс. Это тот вывод, к которому приходим сегодня. Если вы представляете собой хорошую школу, сертифицированную Амбой, можете предложить учащимся 500 часов в классах, порядка 500 часов коллективной работы, чтения и 2000 часов как минимум. Это то время, которое затрачивается на получение аккредитации. Это примерно год работы. 50 недель, где-то по 40 часов. 
Но большую часть э, жизни вы учитесь не в программе MBA, а учитесь в самой жизни. В будущем каждый будет изучать свою собственную дисциплину. Вы подключаетесь к сети, включаете э, свое устройство и э, проходите программу своим темпом, тем, который вам наиболее комфортен. Сегодня предлагаем комплексное смешанное обучение. Не, это не такое обучение, которое предлагалось раньше. Мы называем это смешанное обучение. Мы уходим от э, ситуации, когда э, преподаватель стоял перед вами на кафедре и читал вам э, лекцию. Вы изучаете основные факты, подчерпываете их из сети, после этого приходите в класс и там уже обсуждаете все это. Вы получаете базовые э, концепции э, в сети, а э, затем вы тратите сотни часов на расширение ваших знаний и на поиск ответов на вопросы. Что касается э, содержательной части образования и э, донесения контента э, до учащихся, что мы будем до них доносить? У каждого человека в голове два полушария мозга, левое и правое. Левое полушарие у большинства людей, подавляющего большинства людей, отвечает за логику, точность, анализ, стратегию, контроль, науку. Именно здесь находятся все эти сводные таблички и так далее. А правая часть отвечает за эмоции, за страсть, за творчество, за любовь. Если вы хотите быть эффективным руководителем, вам необходимо, чтобы оба полушария вашего мозга работали. Вы должны быть хорошим специалистом и э, в теории, и в табличках разбираться, и в графиках. Но при этом вы должны позаботиться о том, чтобы все происходило вовремя, и чтобы все это было в достаточной степени правильно эмоционально окрашено. Так что вам требуется оба полушария. Таким образом, бизнес-школа, в частности, система образования, в общем, всегда была нацелена на воздействие на левую половину мозга. Это проще. Рассказываешь человеку, что такое А, Б, В, Г, Д, и можно дальше измерять результат. И намного сложнее работать с правым полушарием мозга. А это очень важно сегодняшним руководителям. Требуется не только IQ, но и EQ. Им требуются аналитические способности, но в не меньшей степени они должны уметь работать с людьми. On sending photos and sending attachments and occasionally doing voice messages and all sorts of things. A brilliant system. But 600 million of them doing it. And so you've got to be able to match that in the classroom. There's no point in them having excitement doing that outside the classroom and then it all being very boring inside the classroom. So simulations and games, living cases, study trips and visits abroad to actually visit the world. Consulting projects, so you're actually dealing with human beings at companies. Mandatory internships, so you actually have a job to do when you go to a company. And an integrative final project where you try and bring it all together. So very much more a practical, experiential, and interactive activity. Now, I've observed over these last many, many decades how business education has changed. When I did my MBA a long, long, long time ago, it was mainly about functional skills. Planning, marketing, finance, accounting, IT, operations, human resources. You had to do various compulsory courses, then you were allowed to do a few elective courses. But you had to cover the, all of that stuff. And that is still important. We still need business people who speak the language who when somebody says depreciation or market share or something, they know what the language means. That is clearly vital. If you don't speak the language, you go to a country, you don't speak the language, it's a lot more difficult than if you do speak the language. And we need to have people to understand the language of business. But then it moved on, mainly in the 80s, I would say, to human interaction. People realized that just being good at accounting was not the whole of life. And so leadership, responsibility, ethics, teamwork, 
communications came in and a lot of teamwork, a lot of activities to foster that took place. And business schools worked on that and then generally most have been quite successful at actually doing the human side of business. It then moved on further more, with more difficulty to stakeholder awareness. Because if you talk to a senior person, whether a dean or director, or the president of a company, or the uh, head of a charity, or whatever it may be, and you ask them, well, what did you do last week? Did you do functional skills? Did you do teamwork? Generally, they didn't, no. So what did they actually do, these highly paid people? They actually dealt with the outside world. And we used to draw a little box, nice little rectangle, company or organization. And it happened all internally. In fact, that's not what happens. The senior people deal with the outside world. And they need to understand the global trends, the local trends, the government, the media, the customers, the suppliers, employees, the unions, and the local communities. Because it's those things that really affect the success. If you have a problem with your customers or your suppliers or the local community gets upset or the unions go on strike or whatever it might be, that's a real problem. And you have to keep good relationships and you have to understand all of the stakeholders. And that is more difficult for a business school because professors are not so good at that. It needs people who've actually been out there doing it. And it's more difficult to bring them in and do seminars and other things to talk about stakeholder awareness. But then now, we're at a stage where we've moved on again. And we're on the right brain skills. And I'll talk about each of these. Culture, leadership, entrepreneurship, and creativity. And they're the right brain skills, unlike the others. So we've moved very much from the left at functional skills a little bit of right, a fair amount of right, and now really concentrating on the right-hand side of the brain. And it's very important, as you'll see, that business schools react to that and that students, alumni, and everybody else gets that experience. So firstly, culture. What is culture? Well, culture is the way we do things when nobody tells us how to do them. We do it naturally. We pick up a knife and fork, or we open a door, or whatever we do. But culture is like water to a fish. A fish does not know that water exists until it jumps out of it. So if you just live in your own little village somewhere, to take an extreme example, as far as you know, that's how it always is. People get up in the morning, they go to the fields, they do the crops, they come home, have dinner, and go to sleep. You know, that's life. As you gradually expand, you get to know more. You come to a big city like Moscow, whatever. Maybe eventually you go to another country and you realize, gosh, a whole lot of things that you assumed were normal are not normal at all. And I'm involved in China now. The reason I was in China, I'm opening some schools for pupils, not students, for pupils, for 16 to 19 year olds to help the Chinese to acclimatize for when they come to Western universities. Because at the moment, there's a very big dropout rate of Chinese students who are intelligent, disciplined, hardworking, all the perfect students. But they cannot adjust to the different culture. And so we're going to have a three-year program to help them to do that from age 16 to 19. And culture is like water to a fish. They don't realize that it's different out there. So in Europe, and it's, this is not just China, Europe, if you're lucky enough and you're a very good person, you go to heaven, you'll find that the nannies are British. The cooks are French, the engineers are German, the administrators are Swiss, and the lovers are Italian. <laughs> However, if you're a bad boy or girl and you go to hell, you'll find the nannies are German, the cooks are British, the engineers are Italian, the administrators are French, and the lovers are Swiss. <laughs> Hope there are not too many Swiss people here. So we are all like everybody else. 
We all have basic human needs. We eat, we drink, we breathe, etc., etc., etc. Basic human needs, like everybody else. We're also like nobody else. Each person is unique in his or her own rights and background, education, parents, whatever it might be. Everybody's different. We can look, I look around this room. Everybody, I think, has got two eyes, two ears, and a nose and a mouth. But I can see that you're all different. But like some others, and this is our culture, we share it with some, but not with others. It can be national and ethnic, so you're largely Russian, so you've got things in common, Mother Russia, all sorts of things like that. Your employer. There's a great difference between the culture and different employers, of different employers, between an Apple and a General Motors and a Rolls-Royce or whatever it might be. Functional. We all know the marketing people and the production people and the finance people are completely different. They generally don't like each other much. They think the other person's got it all wrong. And they live in their own functional world. And then even on a team, when you put a team together, you find that people are very different. And they bring different perspectives, which in practice is actually very good. And this is one of the things you do learn at business school. You bring people from different nationalities or different backgrounds together to solve a problem. And that's a good thing. But the cultures of those people are very different. And it's the clash of cultures which gives the good answer. So here's some people doing what comes naturally to them, just as an example. All sorts of different people, that's what they do. That's the atlas of faiths, all the religions in the world. Again, a huge, disparate group of people whose upbringing has led them to believe in particular aspects of faith. So let's move to leadership. Why do we want leadership? Well, as the world becomes more global, we have to compete against people around the world. And people are the greatest asset for any organization. And whether for a country or a company, whether sadly fighting a war or trying to increase market share, in the end, competition is between workforces. So leading those workforces is increasingly important. And organizations have to be led to overcome their own inertia. If they're not led, they just sit there like a jelly, sort of wobbling a bit and uh, not going anywhere. And leadership is what gives an organization its vision and then translates that vision into reality. And the process of developing the vision and then communicating the vision so that people do it is really important. Because you want to end up with people who are more motivated to do your vision than somebody else's vision. And the uh, message of countless case studies is quite clear. If you want to inspire others, you have to inspire yourself. If you don't give an impression of being inspired by your own vision, you really can't expect other people to be inspired by your vision. And so leadership reconciles the wood and the trees. That's an English phrase which means the big picture and the little picture. You're up in the helicopter looking at the wood, seeing the total map, but you're down there as well looking at each individual tree. And leadership, in the end, gives the heartbeat to the organization. So it's absolutely vital. But the leader of the future will be different, mainly because the employee of the future will be different. Knowledge workers will have little organizational loyalty. They'll view themselves as professional free agents. They might be an accountant or a lawyer or an engineer or an architect or whatever it is. They're not too fussed where they work, but they want to work within their own field. But they will take their skills from employer to employer, whichever employer offers them the best package of salary, location, job, whatever it may be. And so telling people what to do becomes a bit ridiculous. Um, when you've got these people who can just up and move on. And like the old days, where lots of people lived, worked for 40 years with one organization. So you have to balance following the rules. You still do need some rules, obviously. 
but versus getting things done. And the leader will be more in a mode of asking for input and sharing information, not a command and control from the top situation, but trying to find out what's going on and then coming to some decision. And skills in hiring, retaining talent, getting the best people will be a valuable commodity for the leader of the future and something which business schools can help to teach. And leading across a fluid network when there's permanent ambiguity, when you really don't actually know quite what's going on, when there's all sorts of external pressures upon you, is really quite tricky and still to produce results. And remote teams are more difficult to communicate with. A lot now of borderless business, if you're with an accounting firm or an advertising agency or whatever, you might have part of the team in Hong Kong, part of the team in Moscow, part of the team in London, part of the team in San Francisco, different time zones, different cultures, different whatever, and trying to manage those people remotely is challenging. A complex matrix organization, and if the management is not very good, the team will fall, fall apart very quickly. And Blaine Rushak, who's the National Director of US Campus Recruiting for KPMG, the accounting firm, said globalization continues to transform the business landscape. This has led to an increased hiring emphasis on college graduates that possess or have the ability to acquire global skills and competences. Having professionals with international experience gives us a competitive advantage because clients increasingly are looking for advisors who can offer global perspectives. And Rosabeth Moss Cantor, a professor at Harvard, said this new type of hero must learn to operate without the might of the hierarchy behind them. The crutch of authority must be thrown away and replaced by their own ability to make relationships, use influence, and work with others to achieve results. And that's a whole different sort of leadership than the classic leadership that is often taught. So moving and developing that into entrepreneurship. That is the classic hierarchy, the management above the employees, organization charts and lines of authority, a boss, the old man at the top, it normally was a man, and authority generally was enough to get people to do things. And success depended essentially on keeping the boss happy. Um, and this was certainly true in Russia and in a number of other countries that you did what you were told, essentially, and uh, thinking was not particularly encouraged. But Adam Smith, in 1776, <coughs> in his great economic book, The Wealth of Nations, probably the most famous phrase in economics ever written, it is not from the benevolence, that means the goodness, of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner but from their regard to their own self-interest. They don't produce the bread or the beer or the meat because they like you. They produce it because they can sell it to you for more than it costs them to get it. So we address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love. And that is the basis of free enterprise throughout the world. And it's quite remarkable indeed, it was not until 1776 that people realized what was going on. And Darwin, a great Cambridge graduate, of course, was right, the fittest survive. There's a famous book called The Naked Ape uh, by Desmond Morris, and that compares human beings to animals in all sorts of aspects. And it talks about how life was very difficult for us for millions of years. We were up trees, in caves, out on the savanna, trying to stay alive and uh, fighting off whoever came along. And he says that uh, we had to extend our skills. We had to uh, take every opportunity we could and every chance that came along. And that really describes an entrepreneur. You, take, you have to take the opportunities as they come along. And Robert Heller, who sadly died a year or so ago, a famous British management writer, 
put it in terms of the tide. He said, some people go down to the beach, and they go in the water, and they go in up to their ankles, or their knees, or possibly their thighs, and they have a little paddle, and they're very happy, and they come out again. He contrasts that sort of person with a heroic navigator who goes off to the other side of the world somewhere. And he obviously acknowledges that the navigator can die en route, may never get there, may drown, much less safe. But if the navigator does get to the promised land, then the uh, benefits of riches and all the rest of it will be very much greater than the person who just does the paddling. And so part of entrepreneurship is to encourage people to take a chance, but to take it on the basis of good planning and good thinking and with a good team. Because entrepreneurs, they think the unthinkable. But the strange thing about them is they then go and do it. A lot of people think the unthinkable, but often don't go actually out there and do it. And the problem is that success cannot be easily predicted. Many are called, but few are very successful. I'm sure we all know the stories of taking pop groups, the Beatles, Rolling Stones, people like that, who were turned down by countless record companies um, in the early days of their careers as being no good, as they said about Mick Jagger. Well, we don't, we don't mind the band. They're quite good, but we really don't like that chap in the front. Um, and like exploration, at the beginning, we cannot gauge success. If we knew it was going to be successful, it would obviously be easy. But we don't know it's going to be successful. And watching a, a new company is a bit like watching a rocket taking off. Some rockets blow up as they take off on the landing, on the, on the, on the, on the launch pad. Some sort of get half the way to the stratosphere, and then they blow up too. And just a few actually manage to get up to the stratosphere and have a successful life going around the Earth or Mars or wherever it is they've been pointed. And it's very much like that with entrepreneurs. And it applies to all new ideas and projects, not just in business. It applies in government, in charities, and in all sorts of other organizations. But risk is an inherent part of progress. If we all did tomorrow what we did yesterday, the world would not move on at all. If somebody's got to do something different to get it going. The guy had to buy the six Starbucks coffee shops, thinking that maybe he could sell coffee for $3 a cup. Everybody thought he was balmy. But he did, and he's got you know, thousands of coffee shops now around the world. You have to do something different if the world is going to progress. Well, there's this group of people. If you were the bank manager, would you invest in them? Nice little group of chaps came in, and one chap S, I think, two chap S's, and uh, they said, oh, we'd like some money. What would you do? Well, obviously, you should give them the money, because the chap down there in the bottom left-hand corner happens to be a young Bill Gates. And had you uh, given them some money, you certainly wouldn't be wasting your time sitting here now. So uh, you would have done extremely well. And so there's a risk of no risk. Mark Twain said, 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones that you did do. So throw off the bowlines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. And Theodore Roosevelt, former president, said, the only man who never makes a mistake is the man who never does anything. And I'm sure that applies to the female gender as well. So finally, creativity. Complacency is a real problem. Picasso, one of the most creative people, said, success is dangerous. One begins to copy oneself. It is more dangerous than to copy others. It leads to sterility. A Norman Foster, famous British architect, said, creativity and arts cannot prosper without uncertainty. 
In other words, you have to give it a go and see what happens. Because the creative spirit shapes the human personality, the right-hand side of the brain. It brings out people's full potential. It opens up a new horizon for every person. It maintains their emotional balance because the whole brain is working properly and their EQ. And it tends to foster harmonious behavior because um, nations and regions and tribes and whatever can communicate through art where they may not be able to communicate through other mechanisms. But arts education, arts have traditionally been a low priority for many schools and other leading academic institutions. They're viewed as peripheral to the true purpose of education, seen as extraneous, extracurricular, and expendable. But arts can bridge the cultural divide. And in the modern world, success requires creative people who can power the knowledge industries. And around the world, I see, not least in China, they wish to move from made in China to designed in China as their national plan slogan. And it's true around the world that people need to be at the creative end. Of the seven billion people in the world, about a billion live in conditions like as you live in and I live in, in the West. North America, Europe, Aust Japan, and Australasia. The other six billion don't. So they've got to use their wits, their skills, and their creativity to move forward. And so there's a fourth R. We have in Britain a phrase, the three R's. It was actually coined by a predecessor of mine as alderman of the ward of tower of the city of London about 300 years ago. A chap who happened to be illiterate, but he said there are three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But now there's a fourth R, arts, and that needs to be there. And Plato said, music is a more potent instrument than any other for education. And children should be taught music before anything else. Well, interestingly, we now know that if you're very good at playing the piano or the violin or the oboe or the clarinet or whatever, very technically skilled, you can read the music, you can play the notes perfectly, very, very, very few of those people because it's a left brain skill. Very, very, very few ever become good composers, which is a right brain skill. So they're very good at the mechanics, and it's often said that music and maths go together, but they're not very good at composing and creativity. Whereas if you take the opposite side, like a Beethoven, he's jolly good on the right-hand side, but not so good on the left-hand side. And we need both sides. And Yehudi Menuhin said, there's a lack of mediation and creativity everywhere, especially in schools. The arts are missing from our lives, and we're giving way to violence. So at Amber, we run an innovation award for business schools every year. I have the privilege of chairing the panel. And two or three years ago, it was won by the Alba Business School in Greece. And they needed new models for thinking, leading, and generating effective responses. And they said that the traditional curriculum of the MBA is lacking in teaching approaches that foster creative thinking, risk-taking, and experimentation, all of which are needed in the workplace. And the traditional focus on analytical methods and knowledge, reflecting a bias, as I said, to rational, scientific, logical method, can stifle creative thinking, and limit the understanding of new challenges. As a result, there is growing demand for renewing business education by adopting theories and practices from humanities, philosophy, and arts that can break the mold of the typical MBA education. And Lisbon, who also won the Innovation Award uh, a couple of years ago, they have a Friday forum concept. They don't do MBA stuff on Fridays. They don't do sort of accounting or marketing or anything like that. They have a creative day every Friday and exploring new lands, as they put it, the journey concept, self-reflection out of the comfort zone. 
experience, use of other arts. They get in speakers. They might be artists or opera singers or sculptors or whoever they are, other locations. And to be better human beings, to become better leaders. And innovation happens when you're given the freedom to try and experiment and when you're not afraid of failing. If you're afraid of failing, then you won't let yourself go. You've got to let yourself go to really be creative. I remember a long time ago, some management course at um, Cadbury Schweppes, so it was a long time ago, a chap came in and said, we're going to do creativity today. So, and jolly good, we all said. He said, I want you to think of how many uses are there for a paper clip. I got about eight or ten, I think. The chap, one chap got 26. It's amazing. How many uses are there for a paper clip? Just try it. You know, you've got two minutes or something to think of uses for a paper clip. But that's just a very simple example of how wide the brain is expanded. Some of his uses were not particularly sensible, but nevertheless he'd come up with the uses. So, just to finish, especially for our students and alumni, college is something you complete, hopefully. A career, though, is something you experience. And in life, there is no core curriculum. The entire place is an elective. There's nobody telling you you have to do this course. You can choose yourself what course you want to do. The paths are infinite. The results, uncertain. Alfred Lord Tennyson, the poet, said in Ulysses, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And life is not a dress rehearsal. It's not like we're going to put on the, the real performance tomorrow. Life is not a dress rehearsal. We only get one chance. So we might as well make as much of it as we can. But your career is not everything. And you'll find that you have many other responsibilities and interests. And I think it's helpful to imagine life as a game in which you're juggling five balls. Work, family, friends, health, and spirit. You're trying to keep all the balls in the air at once. And you'll soon understand that work is a rubber ball, especially if you've got an amber accredited MBA. If you drop it, it will usually bounce back. But the other four balls, family, friends, health, and spirit, are made of glass. If you drop one of these, they'll be scuffed, damaged, or even shattered. They'll never be the same. So try to understand that and try for balance in your life as well as a good career. So what matters most is how you see yourself. When you look in the mirror, do you see a little pussycat smiling back at you? Or do you see a lion or lioness? And even Bill Gates doesn't get it all his own way. He even has his problems. And I leave you with a story from a predecessor of Bill Gates, Sir Paul Getty, one of the very first billionaires in the world. And he was asked what advice he would give young people so that they could have the same success that he had. He said, well, I think there are three things. He said, get up early, firstly. Secondly, work hard. And thirdly, find oil. <laughs> so good luck. Thank you, Sir Paul. My colleagues, our speakers today have expressed their opinions, their views in different ways on education, on adult education, on the importance and significance of it. But many times people said that our today's meeting was made possible by the organization, the AMBA Association, amongst its 50th anniversary and the representative 
representatives of the AMB decided uh, to start celebrating this event here in Russia and uh, to celebrate uh, this 50th uh, 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 jubilee. Uh, uh, they decided uh, to award each of the Russian schools, which contributes to the success of the organization, uh, to give them with a certificate in order to show that uh, they were uh, the first who started celebrating this event this year, and that we are those people who make the input into the development of management education. Uh, uh, in the world. Now I would like to ask the executive director of the AMB, Andrew Main, uh, Wilson, uh, to come here to the rostrum and to hand in the certificate to the representatives of each of the Russian schools. So we have there's a bit of a logistical nightmare in this audience in terms of being able to move around. Um, but we would, we would very much welcome um, a senior representative from each of our 11 schools to collect their certificate. And Ashot will call out each one. Some of you, of course, are on the platform. And those schools that aren't here, we will give to, tonight at the special dinner that we have. Я хочу сразу предупредить, что нет никакого смысла в той последовательности, которая будет выдаваться сертификат. To warn you that there is uh, no uh, mean uh, significance of the order in which certificates are given out. The Plekhanov Business Integral School. Uh, business and uh, Management Administration uh, uh, Institute of the Iranipa. The International uh, Institute of Management uh, Link. Mirbis. In this St. Petersburg, Mirbis. As in every uh, business school. The Kazan Federal University Business School. Uh, a State Management University Business School. The Higher Management School of St. Petersburg. Kingston. Mm -hmm. Red. Uh, the uh, NIPA Higher Social and Economic uh, School.
Oh, uh, thank you so much for coming. There is food and drink outside. Um, we, I'm sorry a few of you have had to stand for quite some time. We've just been overwhelmed by the numbers. It's wonderful. I hope you found it very useful. I think particularly on behalf of, of Paul and I, um, we'd like to thank you for the whole Guide Our Forum. It's been absolutely excellent. Um, and the first thank you is to all the volunteer students. Um, you have just been amazing. I mean, Valerie, who is sitting there, kindly brought Paul and I here the other morning and then went and did an exam. I mean, that is amazing. You wouldn't find many British students who'd come and give you a lift into work on the day that they had an exam. So to all of you students who've helped today, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all our speakers. And then finally, a particular thank you to Ashot and Sergei, who have worked so hard with us on this event um, and indeed on the Gaidar Forum. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, I hope you found a wonderful day. And we look forward to welcoming many of you as members over the next few months. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having been present at this, uh, for being present at this session. And after this official part, you will be able uh, to socialize uh, outside uh, where we, as I hope, have a little cocktail ready for us.